Colleagues, let's start our session. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that um, the colleagues who are supposed to speak are here. The first speaker on my list will be the organization called Echoing, IDA. Echoing, please uh, proceed. You have the floor. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Once again, we send greetings um, to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the coordinator of the International Decade for people of African descent. Again, my name is Angel Joyce Sala Aina, and I am actually representing the Black Mamas Matter Alliance along with my colleague who's also with Echoing Ida, Elizabeth Goss Gay. And we are here to once again sound the alarm on the high numbers of maternal deaths experienced by black women in the United States of America and globally. Once again, we want to highlight that black women are dying at an alarming rate from pregnancy associate, associated and pregnancy related um, deaths, complications during pregnancy, and they are dying at an alarming rate in the United States and globally. We want the, we request for the United States government to once again recognize the ingenuity of black women, black women leadership in all of our community-based organizations that serve black women and girls in the areas of sexual and reproductive health. This is also inclusive of black and African immigrant um, women who lead their organizations in different pockets of the United States with little to no resources, who are, who are having to provide services to African immigrant and African refugee women with barely any support, and who are meeting the needs of their communities, even though the United States government is swiftly removing resources from these communities on a day-to-day -day basis under this current administration. As the Black Women's, as the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, we address development by advocating for the fair distribution of resources and opportunities, especially with regard to reproductive health care services. We advocate for access to quality health services free from discrimination, acknowledging that health also requires access to the underlying social determinants of health, such as adequate housing, employment, and education. And we center our advocacy in intersectionality by addressing the specific needs and realities of women and girls of African descent, especially in the area of maternal health and reproductive rights. Again, we call upon the U.S. government and other bodies represented here to look at our policy toolkit, which is on our website at blackmamasmatter.org. And we ask you to make a real investment, a real economic investment in the ingenuity of black women-led initiatives in maternal care, both at the federal and state level and at the state levels as well. Once again, I thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak. And thank you, um, echoing Ida. Uh, before I give the floor to the next um, group, Afro Empowerment Center Denmark, I would, I would like to call uh, upon members of the last panel, if there are any in the, uh, in the floor, to come to the platform here. Uh, now I, I now give the floor to Afro Empowerment Denmark, Afro Empowerment Center Denmark. Yeah, I don't see them. Ah, okay. Please uh, proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, is it on? UN delegates and fellow civil society members. My name is Joseph Nielsen. I'm the chairman of Afro Empowerment Center Denmark. Our organization is a part of NPAD and focus our work specifically on promoting the decade of people of African descent and advocating for the full implementation of the UN Cert 34 for people of African descent. Our organization has been doing this work for four years. We're the only organization in Denmark with this specific goal in mind. 
To this date, Denmark has done nothing to promote the decade of PA PADs and the implementation of the framework of the third, uh, third 34, no, yo, 34, or the Durban. And they are still not doing anything to fund these initiatives. We would, of course, have liked to see representative of the Danish member states present at the meeting, but I can see that they are not. In Denmark, a common misunderstanding is that equal data, equality data collection is illegal, and that misunderstanding is very hard to kill. That means that the state has little or no understanding on how people of African descent or Africans are affected by racism, and that the discrimination, however constant, is systematic as well as easy to hide in the manners of which this data is currently being collected. Black women, as well as PAD, LB, LGBTQs, are further excluded. They are not simply victims of patriarchy, but there's no law extending which, uh, existing which to take into account the ex uh, intersections they live with daily. The use of the N-word is not treated seriously by law enforcement. We are essentially living in a nation where calling people the N-word by politicians at or at the media is deemed legal. This means, for, in, for example, that a PAD can be attacked and called the N-word, and it will be processed as a simple assault and not a hate crime. PADs are more likely to spend decades in asylum camps while their cases are being processed, and even while in these camps are typically also victims of racist attacks. The data which our organization have collected show that being black means access to, civil, uh, to citizenships is disproportionately difficult to others. A small organization like ours, who does this work by the members' dues, can only make a small mark if the very bodies that are founded uh, do not um, recognize the decade and the PADs that we are supposed to effect change on are unaware of their human rights and the ways of means to protect themselves. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Afro Empowerment Center, Denmark. Uh, I now give the floor to uh, the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs of the World Council of Churches. You have the floor, Madam. Hello. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Adele Halliday, and I represent the United Church of Canada. I'm also part of the delegation from the World Council of Churches. One of my responsibilities with the church is related to oversight of racial justice. I would first note that the United Church does have a clear anti-racism statement and policies. The United Church of Canada is committed to becoming an intercultural church. The church denounces racism as sin and both emphasizes the imperative for prophetic advocacy by speaking to the world about equity and racial justice. But it is important to note that the church is not exempt from racial injustice and anti-black racism. Rather, racism continues to find expression both in church and society. The anti-racism statement of the United Church of Canada notes that we believe that racism is a sin and violates God's desire for humanity. We believe racism is present in our society and in our church and throughout time has manifested itself in many forms in varying degrees. There are many initiatives that we've implemented nationally to try to combat racial injustice. So for example, our ministers must undergo mandatory racial justice training in order to remain in good standing with the church. We have started uh, conversations about how we might implement the UN decade for people of African descent in our churches and inviting people in local churches into educational processes. And we are starting conversations about dismantling white privilege. But there's still much, much more work that needs to be done. For example, the experiences of many black people who are in leadership across the country continues to be one of painful exclusion, racial discrimination, and systemic racism. A particular challenge of the Canadian context is that because Canada is a seemingly tolerant and multicultural country, that people find it difficult to understand that racism is both institutional and systemic. A further challenge within the church is that we affirm that we are all children of God and that we are one in Christ Jesus. Because of these theological affirmations of unity, however, it is sometimes difficult for people to understand the differences that people of different identities experience, and that particularly anti-black racism is a reality in Canadian churches across the country. As such, I would implore you to involve churches, and particularly churches in the Canadian context, in the ongoing work related to the UN decade, the Declaration and Anti-Black Racism as a whole. 
the work of the decade can only be meaningful if civil society as well as religious leaders and faith-based communities are engaged. Each week our ministers preach on Sunday mornings and they seek to tell truth to their communities and inspire them to do justice. Truth-telling about anti-black racism in the context of the UN decade and the work of racial justice is therefore something that churches must be engaged in. We do recognize the complicity of churches in the past. However, churches and faith-based organizations must need to be equal partners in the work towards racial justice. I thank you. Uh, thank you. I now give the floor to Veta Sein de Schweitz, um, followed by Institute for African Studies. Thank you for uh, giving me the chance. My name is Johannes Brahane. Um, I'm originally from Eritrea, living in Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, the most publicly spread racist image is of criminalizing men of African descent. This has direct effect on black fatherhood, especially for those not nationally recognized language with different religion and culture background. Black fathers, regardless of their residential situation, are being painted at large. Black men don't care for and provide for their family. Black men and fathers, including migrants and refugees, are marginalized, especially in employment, housing, education, and quality health service. Since I am an Eritrean living in Switzerland for almost 30 years, I will give you some example of issues faced by Africans that I observe in Switzerland. For example, Ethiopians, Somalians, and Eritreans usually avoid a direct look from another person as a sign of respect. But in Switzerland, eye contact is interpreted as a suspicious person have, uh, and have something to hide. The Swiss police use it as a means of detect if the person is telling the truth or not. As a result, this has led to many racial discrimination in many communication with the public at large, including racial profile. As shows the case of Mohammed Wabali in 2015, our anti-racism uh, anti law uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't not protect black people from racial profile. Furthermore, the majority of people of African descent and Africans, regardless of their residential permit, have only access to the low pay, paying jobs as a result the systematic injustice and poverty started to re revenge the african community in switzerland never mind the fact that men many of black people are affected by unjust social system black men in switzerland are actually involved in raising their children including feeding and eating males with their children daily uh, or reading children uh, reading to children's daily Father Sein in the Schweiz, the organization that I am representing today, is working with experts, public instruction institutions, including school or other actors in fighting racial discrimination of black men and fathers. In Switzerland, through organization, work, uh, workshop and round table, or awareness campaign. We are, work, we are working hand in hand with different women's organizations, consciously of the fighting against the gender dis disparities within our community. But the work done by so many grassroots organizations, including Father Sign in the Schweiz, alone are not sufficient to attend the needs. The progress, uh, the program of activity of international decade must be institutional in all public policy in Switzerland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I now give the floor to Institute for African Studies. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ea Chotafara. Uh, most of the the top the areas I wanted to cover has been raised. Uh, having said that. The expert groups, I imagine, in the months and years to come, hopefully will present a case study or a material-based evidence 
on historical aspects of uh, Africans and people of African descent. The cases that has been raised on repatriation, restoration, and other issues. And a continental-based report from our co different continents to be submitted the state of Africans and African descent. Uh, hopefully, the African diaspora in every specific country can support intellectually and funding or supporting has to be uh, uh, given to the diaspora uh, community in their perspective countries. For that matter, I hope members of the United Nations, each state, will invest first in the diaspora in their own countries about fact findings and the state of Africans. Uh, the notion that the personal data Protection Act should not be used as a pretext to not elaborate the numbers and the uh, population or the community, the size of people of African descent. In that matter, hopefully the academics and academic institutes, especially activists, will provide and probably uh, will provide the material to you and yourself also uh, to initiate or encourage in working together, in dialoguing with the African diaspora. The last one, the African Union as well has an initiative sees the African diaspora and people of African descent as the sixth region. And therefore, I think for political positioning, it could be advisory, I think, to work also with the, uh, the African uh, Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Institute of African Studies. Um, let me give the floor now to the Secretary to make an agent announcement. This is how the Secretariat had just walked out, but I'll do it instead. There are four people, um, participants at the conference, that have not collected their checks for their, D for their DSA. And um, the bank closes at 4.30, so they will not be able to cash their checks if they do not collect it now. The names are Lucia Antonia Lopez, Luis George Paul Tin, Deborah Coles, and Aliu Tonkara. So please go and collect your checks because the banks will close, and today is Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for that important announcement. Um, let's now move to um, the community of originals from Afro-Asian countries in the Republic of Moldova, Kotaram. Dear Africans, dear people of African descent, dear participants of regional meeting, let me greet you and <clears throat> thank you for your presence and sharing your inspiring stories which empower and make sense, especially uh, in the context of the small communities of people of African descent who understand that they go through this fight not being isolated or alone. I'd like to welcome this opportunity as well to raise awareness and visibility of small community of people of African descent living and trying to integrate in uh, the Moldovan society. But I'd like to start with a um, notion of blackness. Uh, today, blackness is a reflection of existing discriminatory policies in the world, locally, nationally, or glo and globally. It's like a very damaging uh, virus which replicates itself where these uh, policies exist and which uh, generate inequality. Today, it doesn't matter, has the, community, uh, has the country colonial past or not, Africans, people of African descent suffering in any part of the globe because of a negative image of blackness tied to poverty, sickness, which have been for 
universally imposed for centuries and uh, discourse about reparation of slavery now conveniently being substituted and reduced to a simple story and debates over prejudice and stereotypes uh, to, to consequences and not uh, causes. That's why it is of, of crucial importance to uh, speak and address uh, the causes, not uh, agreeing upon a fragmentary representation. Now I'm going to speak about the problems of people. Uh, so uh, it started in 1917 and, and 1980s where uh, people come um, as a students. Uh, today, perception of people of African de descent hasn't much evolved and still is boxed to exotic and unusual phenomena. During the first 10 years since independence, the number of people of African de descent has been dramatically decreased from several thousand to few hundred. This was due to a strong social economic impact which severely affected the community, both reflecting the general trend of society to leave the country as an escape from prolonged socio-economic crisis, along with stagnation in the enjoyment of their basic human rights. Now the core of the community is shaped by people Sorry, uh, who have family ties and sacrificed their um, uh, present in order to uh, keep their families in a uh, tow um, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to say that. One moment. The existing policies are too general. It doesn't uh, target the group as specific problems of the community. Commonly, there is no clear vision of African community. We are not seen by authorities or social researchers as one integral community. The stagnation in integration process of members of the community, as well as many other structural issues which have been lasting for more than one decade, is due to inaccurate representation of target group and specific problems we are facing, both pr proving that the solution to any problems lies and starts with a correct identification. Sorry, I missed off my... Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Kotam. I now give the floor to Comitado Tre October. Comitado Tre October. Please go ahead. And Seoul Robo, Rebo Movement, please prepare. Please go ahead. See, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear chairperson. Thanks for this opportunity. My name is Fernando Vasco Chironda. I currently live in, in Italy. And I represent the Comitato 3 Ottobre, which is a human rights association founded in the aftermath of the tragedy that occurred in Lampedusa in 2013, in which 368 people migrants lost their lives trying to reach Europe to seek for, for deportation. Well, uh, when we looked to the general situation regarding the rights of people of African descent, I think that maybe we will have to, I mean, maybe we reach the moment that we, we should be honest with ourselves and try to recognize that uh, the deny to fulfill with our rights is total proportional to the lack of will of, and commitments of member states to take concrete measures and to, to eradicate systematic discrimination, racial profiling, kidnaps, police violence, social exclusion, and the many other human rights violations faced every day around the world. Member states often coming out with wonderful statements on how they agree to protect the rights of people of African descent. At the end of the thing, re everything remained the same, and sometimes even worse. Uh, we, have, we have seen in a country like USA, where killings of black people became the normality in Latin America, in Brazil, and the other EU countries, or in Asia. Yesterday, I was totally disappointed by the EU representative statement who came here to tell us how good the EU is doing to protect and fulfill the rights of people of African descent. But probably she forgot to tell or to mention even a word on how the EU policies are negatively impacting in the rights of migrants and people of African descent in Europe. She forgot to tell us what the most, uh, uh, what can I say, the most EU policies and practice obligates EU member states to literally confine migrants in the detention center without any basic rights. 
We can see it happening in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, in the country where I'm coming from, and in many other EU countries. For example, following one of the EU decisions on migration, Italy adopted several security measures which, which basically paved the way for the eradication of racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and social exclusion of people of African descent. Italy has signed an agreement with Libya, a country where, which is run by different armed groups now to prevent and to combat the, the so-called illegal immigration of people who are just trying to reach Europe to, re to seek for the protection. The CNN journalist, like some weeks ago or days ago, was able to show us and show the whole world what exactly is happening in, in Libya and which prices migrants and people of African descent are paying because of such kind of agreements. The EU is blinding all this, but let's not forget that Italy is a state part of the EU who was recently awarded and with the Nobel Prize. So basically, as you know, people of African descent may, are made it invisible and they are not part of state's agenda, at least in terms of concrete action and measures. For example, let's ask yourself, since the adoption of the Durban Declaration in 2001, how many countries are really committed to its recommendations? Why after six years, member states didn't come together to decide to transform maybe the declaration into something that would be more powerful, for instance, like a treaty, a convention, uh, or something like that, which could obligate the state to fulfill the rights of people of Afghan descent. In about five years of uh, adoption of the decade, but we still cannot see any concrete economic resources put in there to complain with its goals. But we are here talking about how can we fulfill the right of people of Afghan descent. So, dear colleagues, I'm gonna end with this. Uh, dear colleagues and the people of African descent, I think we just need to come together and unify ourselves. It is our responsibility to come together we need to start looking to the, this issue, not only our, uh, national, uh, with our national interest, but more globally, because we face the same problems all around the world. We cannot continue to delegate someone to fulfill our rights. So we need to come together. We need to start changing the way how we think and how we do these things. We need to start bringing our whole experience together, maybe building a kind of platform so that we can discuss this issue in a proper manner without like delegate completely this duty to the member state because we have seen that they are just talking and talking and talking. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Seo Rob Rebo Movement and we still have other organizations to speak. So let's uh, try and limit our comments so that we all have an opportunity to speak. So, rebel movement. Do we have so rebel movement in the room? They are not in the room. There are two other organizations that uh, were not in the room earlier on. I don't know if any are now back in the room. Uh, if, if they are not, then uh, we'll proceed to two organizations that were supposed to speak under the, the justice theme. That is uh, You'll Grow Line, Eagle's Line. You have the floor. Followed by Centro Panafricano, uh, if they can prepare. So you grow, you have the floor. Bonjour, Monsieur. Good afternoon, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, members of the committee. I am Lynn Ingrew, 
I represent the international movement for reparations and the sixth region of the Astral Caucus. And I would like to tell you about police violence and brutality against our community. Since 17th February 2017, the French government has been questioned by the OHCHR on police violence. Six experts were requested to investigate. They reported on 13th May 2017, especially on the cases of Theo Luaka, Adama Traore, and Francois Baiga. France had 60 days to respond, but their response did not satisfy you. So we would like to know what are the provisions you in, the measures you intend to take concerning this situation your experts made several recommendations but unfortunately to date the family of adama traore is a victim of daily harassment they are thrown into prison as well as Theo. Theo, as you know, was brutally attacked by the French police. His rectum has been perforated over a length of 10 centimeters. France signed the convention to prevent torture, uh, xenophobia, and violence. Today, we are shocked to see that so much time has passed. And we go from meeting to meeting. And in the United States of America, the police behave in a lethal manner. They kill our brothers and sisters. We've seen images of this. The same is true in France. There is a young man currently in coma in Paris because he was suffocated by the police. I think the Human Rights Commission should intervene because we are very unhappy to see what is going on. As Monsieur Fanon would say, we seem to be the most unfortunate people on earth because all disasters fall upon our heads. I know there's not much time, but let me just ask you, what measures do you intend to take as regards the slavery today in Libya? We've known for centuries where slavery and human trafficking has come from. And we hear on the television everywhere that this is still going on. What are you going to do? Will eyes be averted again from this crime against humanity? We, the small people who have no power to take decisions, are tired of being decapitated in a plot to exterminate our race. But you have contacts with those who govern us. I beg you to ensure that a law is passed to stop these atrocities, these murders, and this violence once and for all. And also, we need reparation. All these persons should receive reparation, and the diaspora and Africa as well should receive reparations for all the crimes against humanity they have suffered already. Because we cannot continue to have this cemetery growing, and we cannot keep coming back here and hearing the word sorry. We can't. We can if we wish to, and we must continue to fight for reparations. Thank you. Um, I now give the floor to Central Panafricano. Dear sisters and brothers, I will speak on justice from an international political perspective. We are here reporting the current situation in our respective countries. And we can all conclude that adverse conditions still prevail and that we still have immense efforts to do to change the current situation. Also, from the side of the member states, 
We still haven't heard much on what have they done to accomplish the different programs of action since Durban 2001. Being an historian, I want to remember that racism was built for the enslavement of millions and millions of Africans and that the result weakening of the African continent prepare the conditions for the colonial invasion. It is important to understand then that vulnerability is not accidental, but forced. For the decade to be effective, effective in reaching our goals, we must reorient a significant part of our efforts. We must be significant in help building a free, fully democratic and united Africa that could become a major obstacle for the oppression of Africans around the globe. This aim of reconnection and reinforcement must be combined with our current efforts in confronting the domination agenda of the new colonial countries, as they are the ones driving the policies of injustice and equality in Africa. For justice to be rich, bearing in mind that slavery is a crime against humanity, we must conclude that nothing of what is currently happen happening in the world, I say nothing, is worse than the sale and buy of human beings. In Spain, we are organizing a massive protest in front of the Libyan embassy in Madrid for this Sunday that we will be followed by other protests. And from this meeting of the decade of people of African descent, I call on the need for a final a firm statement of condemnation of the enslavement of our sisters and brothers in Libya. These are moral grounds for reparation. <clears throat> we will not have legitimacy on claiming reparations from the crimes of the past if we don't stand firmly against the injustices of today. Thank you, Asante Sana. Thank you, uh, Asande Insana. Um, I think that was our last uh, speaker from the floor. Uh, I think um, I, I thank you very much for your uh, very rich contributions. I think we've all demonstrated that uh, we cannot have meaningful development without the participation of people of African descent. I will now turn to the panelists uh, for their last thoughts, the concluding remarks or takeaways. Um, I don't know if you can do that in one minute each. Um, I, I'm sure I will try. Uh, this time around, I'll start from my left uh, with our colleague, uh, Ilaria Sobas. Ilaria, you have the floor. Am I on? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, 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 I seriously, this time I will stay within my time. Um, I, I really have been very um, enriched, you know, by hearing um, the narratives, the stories of not just um, not just not just folks from my side of the world, North America, and Americas, but from from Europe as well. I mean, it's been very eye-opening. Um, I certainly um, want to emphasize that um, again, as I said in my. In my, in, in when I spoke, that um, development, I think, has to be for, for, for persons of African descent. It has to be reparative. reparative. Um, it can't simply be a matter of, 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 of trying to, 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 to catch up, um, you know, within a, a, a paradigm that, 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 to a large extent, privileges. Um, individualism and 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 and, 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 um, and whiteness, frankly. So, um, Ambassador, I think I, that I'll leave it there so that I can remain within my one minute. Thank you. I now turn to uh, Valen <laughs> Shepard, uh, Madam <laughs> Shepard. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and thank everyone who is in the room for staying the course. I just want to say that I'm reiterating some of the points I made this morning, that reparation has to be framed within the discourse of development. While it takes cash to care, it is not being framed within 
the context of a financial payout, individual or collective, to people of African descent in different countries. In any event, I don't see how a cash equivalent can ever be placed on the pain of what we suffered. But the reparation claim is alive. It exists in many countries. It's developing as a global movement. It is a right, as Jose Marti put it. It is a right. It is not an act of begging. And that's what I would like to leave with all of you in the room. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Veren. I now give the floor to Tenas Nomovich Ainwood. Tena Yafoko. Thank you to everybody who took part in the general debate. From what we could hear from the experiences you were mentioning, racial discrimination in Europe is still very, very real. The EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA, is about to launch its new report on experiences of discrimination on December 6th, so in 12, 13 days. Um, the last one showed, when asking people about their experiences of discrimination, and this was being asked to, to people of migrant background, uh, the number one most discriminated group was Roma. So 50% of them said they were discriminated based on their racial or ethnic origin within the past 12 months. But the second group was Sub-Saharan Africans and the third group, North Africans. So people of African descent. What the newest data will tell us, we're we will hear very, very soon. I want to say that the wider Europe, the Council of Europe, Europe, but especially the EU has very strong legislation. EU law, the Racial Equality Directive 2043, provides a robust legal framework to fight racial discrimination. But implementation, better implementation, really needs to happen on the ground. And so very quickly, eight very real concrete ways to improve this is appropriate data collection in accordance with EU law, including uh, carefully, uh, um, justifiably using it and protecting it. Positive action measures, well designed and well communicated. Tackling underreporting by awareness raising through campaigns. Education, and education which does not uh, uh, promote stereotypes but fights stereotypes. Training, training of professionals in various fields, so judges and attorneys, but also police, nurses, uh, health professionals, civil servants, social workers. Strategic litigation, more cases where racial discrimination is established by the courts, so we have the spillover effect. Strengthening of equality frameworks, namely NGOs as well as equality bodies, and finally, cooperation. And let me have this opportunity to call the NGOs present here from Europe to contact their respective equality bodies in their own member states and to report cases of discrimination because every equality body works with cases of discrimination and has this responsibility to provide independent assistance to victims of discrimination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tena. Um, I think that concludes um, remarks from our panelists, and um, this really um, leaves me with the pleasant opportun uh, opportunity to thank you very much uh, for your cooperation during this session on development uh, that I moderated, and um, you, you really have been cooperative. I think you've contributed uh, a lot of uh, useful uh, information. It has been a, a fruitful uh, session. I myself benefited immensely uh, from this session, and I hope you did too. Um, let me also thank the interpreters because when I was chairing the, the earlier session in the morning, I didn't thank them for, for allowing us to spill over after 1 p.m. So I, I now turn the floor over to the chairperson who is looking at me uh, with a lot of interest. So, <laughs> Chair, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I would like to ask the other moderator to join us at the podium, please. Yes, no, you. Everybody was called. They were not there. No, 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 they can't do that to us. Okay. 
have hot food. <laughs> yes. Um, let me first start by thanking you, Ambassador, um, as well as the panelists and uh, the participants for their contributions to this discussion on development. It is clear from what we've had that a lot more needs to be done in terms of addressing the economic social rights, including the rights to development of people of African descent in, in the countries covered by this meeting. So I'd like to thank you very much for that. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now we have reached the last leg of the regional meeting and we will listen to a summary of the key points by moderators of the open space discussions, followed by a summary of the general debates by the rapporteur, Ms. Gay McDougall. I now invite the moderator of the first open space discussions, Ms. Verini Shepherd, to present the summary. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading. <laughs> Not my fault. Okay, then. <laughs> okay. I will first ask Ms. McDougall to present a summary. No. Sorry. Who was the first panel? Michael? Evelyn. Okay. I'm sorry. I messed this up. Um, I would now invite the moderator of the first open space discussion. Mr. Balsezak or Ms. Petrus Bari to present the summary. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Microphone. Speaker is inaudible. Microphone, please. Microphone. You have the floor, madam. Microphone, microphone. Microphone, microphone, please. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Microphone for the speaker. It's hard. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Everybody? Okay. So I would like to present the report of the open space discussion that took place yesterday at lunchtime with member states, the civil society, third, the working group and other UN mechanisms. You will recall that in its paragraph 29, the program of activities of the international decade requested to consider adopting measures to further promote and protect the rights of people of African descent as enshrined in international human rights instruments, including through the elaboration of a draft United Nations Declaration on the promotion and full respect of human rights of people of African descent. It has been agreed that the intergovernmental group will discuss the declaration at its October 2018 session. In this context, the working group through its regular work, such as visits, thematic sessions, communications, reports, gathers information and material on human rights and on the situation of people of African descent that can help in the preparation of the declaration. The working group also has started to devote a substantial amount of its work to support 
the dialogue towards the development of the declaration. This is why, as part of the regional meeting for Europe, Central Asia, and North America on the, regional, on the International Decade for People of African Descent, this side event, moderated by the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, was held to discuss the elements that should be included in the Declaration on the promotion and full respect of the human rights of people of African descent, and to look at how the Declaration could be prepared in an inclusive manner, ensuring contribution of all concerned, member states, civil society, and other stakeholders, with the support of OHCHR and UN Special Procedures Mechanism. I will therefore provide the plenary with feedback on what was discussed during this meeting. Member States, civil society, fellows of the OHCHR Fellowship Program for People of African Descent, members of CERD, as I said, and other UN mechanisms, elaborated the discussions around general comments. These general comments were as follows. It is crucial to ensure that the dialogue about the declaration and its drafting includes civil society and that a clear, fair, and transparent procedure is established to deal with our common mandate for the rights of people of African descent. We need to develop a declaration that will issue, that will include, sorry, issues related to the rights of, African, of people of African descent inclusively. Although the declaration is not binding, it should be made in a way that highlights the key human rights concerns and provide a framework to address them. It is an opportunity to define specific rights and specific abuses and propose remedies. It is also an opportunity to specifically and clearly define the rights of people of African descent and their standards and to have a thorough discussion on how effectively to promote, protect, and realize these rights. It was emphasized that the question of people of African descent is a concern for all, not only for people of African descent. Thorough and detailed analysis and data are needed to fit the declaration and better understand the human rights issue at stake. The declaration should be clear about reparations and any form that it should take. A general debate with the international community should take place in preparation of the declaration. Efforts should be made to ensure that the forum of people of African descent is established and used as a platform to prepare for the declaration. The forum should be an open space for dialogue between people of African descent and other stakeholders to reach consensus on the wording and key issues. We will then be able to address themes and inform the declaration on issues such as property, land rights, ancestry land, comprehensive development for communities. The added value of the, of the declaration is twofold, political and legal. It will give the opportunity to member states to systematically discuss the aspects related to the rights of people of African descent. It's true, the declaration will not be binding, but it will help to sustain the dialogue on issues related to people of African descent. I will now provide you with the three major themes that were discussed to be included into the declaration. We need to look at definitions. We need to build a consensus on who are people of African descent. The definition given has to be 
reviewed and ensure that it complies with the Durban definition, Africans and people of African descent. The second area discussed is about the human rights issues and remedies to be included in the declaration. So we looked at a series of human rights issues, the criminal justice system and administration of justice have to be high on the agenda of the declaration as people of African descent requesting their rights are now criminalized. Racial profiling, we need to document our racial profiling disproportionately affects people of African descent and we need to have provision for redress. Hate speech and its specificity towards people of African descent, including the discourse about rice supremacy, white supremacy versus black identity extremism, that new term we just heard about and its consequences. Stereotypes, where are stereotypes? What are they? How they impact the psychology and behavior of, per of perpetrators and also how they impact our cultural identity, our psychology, and how they affect people of African descent and how they bring low self-images and low personal development. We need to look at specific rights of people of African descent. While looking at specific rights, we, knew, we do not want to duplicate. We need to address rights that are not mentioned in other conventions. Structural racism. The declaration has to include specific language about structural racism, which should be made distinct from discrimination as it is one of its consequences. State discriminate people of African descent and policies and legislations stigmatize people of African descent. Impunity, legitimated by state, has to be addressed as one of the major obst obstacles to end discrimination, racism, stereotyping, racial profiling, and police violence. Afrophobia affects all Africans, whether they are people of African descent or not. Discrimination and violence affect all of us for the same reasons. The third area that needs to be included in the declaration is the area of reparations. Redress measures. The declaration should constructively look at what the damage is, clearly document the causes of damage, and clearly document that racism is a consequence and needs uh, redress measures. The right to reparations that has just been uh, mentioned. Reparation is a right. The declaration must include the right for reparations. Reparation is not a new issue. It was already an issue at the end of slavery and some states and individuals received reparation. In some areas, people that had been enslaved reclaimed, demanded reparations, which were never given. Furthermore, the consequences of the enslavement of deported African, the slave trade and colonialism are linked to what happened today in Libya and possibly in other countries. So the right to reparation is key. Collective rights of people of African descent have to be recognized as specific rights, just like the rights of minorities are. This will lead to special measures that could help define reparation for enslavement, slave trade, and colonization. The declaration must also explicitly include transnational rights that have been excluded of third. Issues related to colonialism, debt, migrations have to be included there. Finally, the healing process. A global concept and narrative has to be developed and how healing process has to happen so that our story and our history becomes less fractured and researched on 
and we can at last fill the gaps. The process needs to provide actions to ensure that we will not forget. Education has a big role to play there. Cultural reappropriation, which is linked to the same issue about our lost or unknown culture, our legacy, our history, we need to build on what is common for all the people of African descent. We need to recover elements of our traditions and heritage to reframe our imaginary psychology. As a conclusion, I would like to insist on the recurrent recommendations uh, requested by the meeting. First, reparations in all its forms must be addressed. Structural and institutional racism has to be clearly stated and documented to help its prevention, occurrence, and ensure redress when it happens. Justice is in the program of the decade, but should be more specific regarding the violation of human rights that affect people of African descent. Dialogue and inclusiveness is needed for people of African descent to develop a declaration that speaks to all and includes all issues at stake. The urgency is to act now, not in 10, 25 years. So I would once again like to stress that the working group on the rights of people of African descent stands ready to support and contribute to efforts made by all to draft a declaration that would be a tool towards a UN resolution on the rights of people of African descent. On this note, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yes, I'd like to thank you for that um, comprehensive report um, and look forward to the draft, which would be considered in the context of the uh, um, Intergovernmental Working Group, which I chair. So thank you very much, and I believe that um, you have reflected many of the opinions that have been brought forward by civil society, and it would remain now to have a draft and to try to negotiate a final document. So I thank you very much for that. I would now invite the moderator of the second open space discussion um, to present the summary. Normally it should be three minutes, but... <laughs> I will try. Yes. I will try. You have the floor, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I want to remind you that this just happened <laughs> today. So uh, I intend to present a summary, as you say, but also to do a more extensive report for circulation later. So the theme for our discussion in the open space today was towards provision of effective remedies and reparatory justice. So it was focused on strategies and remedies um, around the issue of reparatory justice. It was stressed at the beginning that reparation for historical wrongs is one prong of the movement. The other prong is raising the issue of continuing harm and current activities which enlarge rather than diminish the claim. And I think that our brother who spoke uh, just a while ago stressed that, that there are continuing policies that should be cataloged and added to the claim. Now, I read the theme that focused our discussion, so I want to stress that while there were many points that were raised by the many people who attended the session, I will only mention those that focus more directly on the topic for discussion, and so I apologize to those who may not hear their points represented. And as I just said, I will do a fuller summary of the discussion and submit to the Secretariat for Circulation to those who registered and attended uh, so we have your contact details. Now, the meeting was provided with examples from, from the history of the movement right from the start to focus the discussion 
to indicate that several debates have arisen um, over the long genealogy of the movement. Debates relating to strategies and forms or form that reparation should take, and the discussion has been mainly around financial reparation versus restitution of extracted sums, for example, from Haiti and the British Caribbean, a development package to be decided with inputs from people of African descent and determined by the context and legal remedies. The, the issue was also stressed uh, or brought up that internal reparation cannot be put off the, uh, off the table, taken off the table, while we press the claim from those who disfigured our societies in the colonial period. So the point is that there are many post-colonial wrongs inflicted on our societies by post-colonial political regimes and that the issue of political reparation um, for those um, post-colonial wrongs must be placed on the table. In the context of my own country, Jamaica, the Prime Minister has now apologized publicly for 1963 post-colonial wrongs which were not perpetrated in his time, but of course, he set the example of the fact that states are, are the ones that, whether they were there in the wrong then, uh, they are in power now, they have a responsibility to address claims for reparation. And he also is talking compensation, because as we know, apology without a package, uh, without compensation, would be like what the former Prime Minister of New Zealand said, uh, would be symbolic only and like a, a, a clanging gong, I think is what he had said. So the, the first point, the, the other point I would like to stress is that coming out of the room was that the claim for reparation is just and remains alive in Africanist diaspora. Madame Mire Fanon Mendes France stressed that no declaration, while we didn't go into the inputs for the declaration, and we, I'm glad we didn't because that was done, um, she stressed that no declaration at the end of this meeting should be developed or published without reparation being there. And based on the Durban experience, I think we would want reparation to be there, not any other substitute our words, like repair and so on. While the debate is alive, while the issue is alive, we said, it could, it could die if we do not prepare successive generations through education and indigenous knowledge production. So unless countries reorient their curricula to include history education as a mandatory part of the education system, and the program of activities for the international decade has some clues about this, then this struggle could die. So education, we stress, is a remedy for structural discrimination. And when we talk about education, we're talking about culturally relevant education as an effective remedy and as a recognition of the rights of people of African descent to knowledge about themselves, to help to develop their identity, um, some of which have sort of disappeared because of colonialism. The production of knowledge will also be part of the remedy to our colonial training to restore the true history of people of African descent and what we contributed to world development. The, the concept of race was discussed. Um, the concept of race, while false and used as a means of dividing the human family, remains a basis of discrimination. And because it does, it means that we still have a basis for fighting racial discrimination. And um, the denial of repertory justice is part of that discrimination since there's precedent for reparation for other groups. Now, while enslavers received payouts at the time of emancipation, and in the case of Haiti to secure its independence, and while there are calls for restitution of those sums in current equivalents, the reparation movement is now framed within the discourse of development. As some often say, it takes cash to care, so a type of Marshall Plan for affected countries 
will take money. But that will be agreed on around a development plan that includes repatriation, development of education, health, land access accessibility, and other development plans. And these the inputs should be sought from people of African descent um, and the, popu the general population, not only by governments. Some stress the issue of African reconnection because of the Maanga Zimi Nisi, and also because of the, the false knowledge about Africa, which resides um, everywhere in, among people of African descent. So psychological repair, African reconnection should be a part of the re remedy. And uh, several of our colleagues who have legal backgrounds, um, for example, Roger Wareham from 12th of December movement in the United States, gave very good examples of legal challenges, maybe not successful, but as a, a, an example of what could be pursued as a remedy. There were discussions around Pan-Africanism, building a stronger African reconnection, which is a key component of the international decade of pe for people of African descent. Um, people stress the fact that this should not be individual reparation, but a collective reparation, and that political reparation ext is extremely important for Africa for an end of colonial discourse that we still hear uh, today. Um, there was a very powerful input about industry legislation to ensure that African communities are empowered and enriched by industries like the marijuana industry. Um, and as one delegate felt that if African people were allowed to develop these, these kinds of industries, then we would be able to actually repair ourselves and have the money to do that um, if others did not try to hold on to, to certain industries that we have developed. Um, there was the issue of genocide, that we have to name some of the wrongs. In fact, there was a, an intervention about this. The context for the claim must be documented. And you may say, but well, we have all the proof in the world. But there is still need for research and documentation so that we are clear about the historical context, the legal arguments, and the justification for uh, the repair. So the, the context of the different context within which reparation has to be worked out came up because th there are many examples from the United States which are driving the movement and we, um, we, we, we are in solidarity. But there are other contexts, like the Caribbean, where we have a 10-point action plan for repatriate justice, which require nuanced discussion. I know the chair is looking at me, so I have to wrap up. Um, and so there, there was also the, the, the issue of a special rapporteur for, to address the demands and violations that people of African descent have brought forward. Um, in terms of internal repair and la language deconstruction was brought up so that we stop talking in terms of slaves and slave trade and slave owners and find other language and stress the need for Afrophobia to be used more and more um, since other violations have names. Um, we spoke about education already. The, we spoke about the Marshall Plan. So I think, Chair, I will stop there because a lot of what we talked about, I think I have grouped under certain headings. But I want to end by stressing that, again, the movement is alive. And even though the responses from Europeans have not been positive, it does not mean that people will not continue to press the claim because, as I said before, it is a just claim. It is not an act of begging. Thank you. I thank you very much for that comprehensive report. Um, even though you only just finished, I wonder what we would have had if you hadn't <laughs> just finished. But thank you very much. I think it's most appreciated. 
I will now move on to invite Ms. McDougall. Ms. McDougall will present a summary of the general debates. Um, you have the floor, madam, and you have six minutes. Thank you. Well, I, I, I may be, it may be that I have the most difficult task of the whole two days. Um, and I will ask apologies for every one whose thoughts did not get in, uh, but it's been a collation in progress, and I want to thank the uh, Secretariat for uh, their critical assistance to this. Uh, for the last two days, we have all participated in a rich and impassioned discussion. In many ways, uh, it has been an unprecedented uh, event. This regional conference for Europe, Central Asia, and North Africa on the International Decade for People of African Descent has been a platform for governments and civil society to discuss as partners the issues and perhaps some solutions to the most troubling obstacles uh, that face uh, and that uh, stand in the way of full enjoyment by people of African descent of their, our, uh, economic, civil, political, social, and cultural rights on an equal basis. Uh, the conference was opened by the High Commissioner who noted that uh, people of African de descent continue to endure pervasive discrimination in law and in practice, uh, extending from neighborhoods and schools to workplaces, political representation, and justice. Whether they are descendants of the victims of slavery brought to North America and Europe against their will, or more recent migrants, people of African descent are frequently denied rights and experience exclusion, humiliation, and impoverishment as a result of racial discrimination. He declared that it is urgent um, and important that such forces be turned around uh, both for the sake of the individual's concern and for the values and vitality of the countries in which we live. <clears throat> An equally strong opening statement was made by Ms. Opal Tometi, who is co-founder of Black Lives Matter, who urged us to understand the transatlantic slave trade as an enterprise of capital and wealth formation, and also to see the problems of Africans uh, and African descendants in the context, in that context, and as a part of the crisis of global capitalism. And that the inhumane tactics being used by European nations to handle the current massive migration trends uh, are having a disproportionate uh, impact on African uh, uh, migrants. Mr. Sibelo Gometsi, chair of the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, emphasized that equality bodies must be involved in decade activities at the national level. He emphasizes structural barriers to racial equality must be tackled in order to break the cycle of intergenerational transmission of inequality. He also spoke about the toxic nature of hate speech and the critical importance of apologies uh, as one element, uh, an essential element of reparations. Ms. Anastasia Crickley, who's chair of the uh, committee, UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, made the point that uh, the convention is as relevant and comprehensive today as it was in the 1960s when it was drafted, particularly 
in its coverage of economic and social rights and its definition of racial discrimination as inequality uh, as uh, effect, in effect. Uh, not solely requiring intentionality. Uh, she said that today's uh, global toxic discourse threatens the progress that has been made over prior uh, decades. We must call out racism in those terms whenever and wherever we encounter it. Ms. Diallo, the uh, French journalist and activist, gave us a graphic picture of black men being sold for $400 um, and being shown, that film being shown on CNN, um, and uh, to question how in 2017 uh, that could be so. Uh, since the year 2000, uh, she said 30,000 migrants, most of them Africans Af from the African continent, have died trying to get to Europe for a better life. But the response of European countries, she says, is uh, to this human tragedy has been inhumane, callous, and in violation of its obligations of, under international law. Uh, before I go on now to the panels, I just want to uh, uh, say that uh, I want to inform uh, all participants uh, that uh, following our deliberations uh, in this uh, regional uh, conference, uh, states uh, participating in this meeting uh, are working now on an outcome document uh, under the facilitation of uh, Belgium. Uh, in this regard, the views and inputs received from various stakeholders uh, will be uh, under consideration and the attempt will be uh, to uh, be inclusive, uh, but uh, leading to a consensus uh, on that outcome document. On the panel on recognition, uh, which was the first panel moderated by our ambassador, uh, Yvette Stevens, uh, who opened the discussion by reminding the three objectives of the decade uh, for the people of African descent. Uh, there was agreement among the five panelists who participated in the discussion that efforts should be done at the international, regional, and national levels to effectively implement the decades program of action. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Reed, who um, is a member of the working group, stated that the recognition, that recognition is key uh, to increase the visibility of Afri people of African descent. And he called upon member states to create policies and programs for the improvement of the situation of uh, African descendants. Ms. Nellie Schmidt informed us of the detailed efforts being undertaken by UNESCO to uncover the and to document the history and the memories of the transatlantic slave trade. In this sense, uh, Mr. Pastor Murillo Martinez expressed that the situation of people of African descent is a consequence of an order uh, that was established with slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, he also informed us of the multifaceted policies of silence and uh, conscious forgetting. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth uh, uh, Kenese um, highlighted the, the importance of uh, intensifying the cooperation between member states and uh, civil society and insisted that without this cooperation, uh, the decade cannot succeed. She forcefully 
reminded us that implementation must occur at, na at the national level. And that is where we must put uh, the majority of our efforts. Uh, we also heard um, video uh, uh, input uh, about the innovative work that is being undertaken in the province of Ontario, Canada. After the panelist interventions, uh, repre uh, representatives of civil society organizations from the United States and various parts of Europe uh, raised some uh, issues and challenges faced by people of African descent around the world, but particularly in uh, those regions, uh, with recommendations to member states. Uh, among those issues and recommendations uh, were, uh, and this is not an exhaustive list, to change the name uh, to explicitly uh, include second and third wave voluntary diaspora uh, to intensify the cooperation between governments and civil society organizations on the drafting of a declaration and uh, establishment of a monitoring uh, mechanism uh, to monitor implementation uh, to coin a definition of ethnic cleansing uh, that would encompass the process of gentrification uh, that is taking place in cities in the industrial northern countries. Um, and that the declaration include a call that public spaces must be free of the iconography of the brutalization of African and African descendant uh, peoples, such as Confederate flags in the United States or symbols uh, denoting uh, skinheads in Europe. Uh, many spoke about the importance of the truth-telling forums that can take many forms and address uh, the intergenerational trauma uh, that exists. The panel ended with a presentation of uh, the uh, blog Afrofoodie, uh, a project of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in the framework of, inter of the international uh, decade and uh, in collaboration with uh, nonprofit organizations, um, and we were treated to some uh, samples of the food. Um, as to the justice, issues relating to justice, um, I want to, uh, with your permission, uh, 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 move, just skip over the description of the issues so that I might uh, read uh, the most important um, recommendations. Uh, one is the situation of peop uh, uh, people of African descent uh, must receive proper recognition. Inherent in this must be a recognition of past injustices against people of African descent and steps toward reparations and restitution. Uh, this is requested uh, uh, that there be a international conference on reparations. Another point in the re recommendations was a need to recognize the, the need for the recognition of the particular inequalities, racism and ex exclusion experienced by African uh, de descendants. Um, and that it's also necessary to have a commitment, uh, solidarity, and resources to ensure the development of people of African descent in Europe and beyond. Um, there's another recommendation that says regionally and at the level of the European Union, people of African descent are calling for a EU framework 
uh, for national strategies to combat Afrophobia. Uh, there uh, is a suggestion that, that there is a need for uh, equality data. This has been stressed many times. Um, uh, equality data based on self-identification to tackle structural discrimination. There's a need uh, for more reporting and studies on people of African descent and Africans um, and, and what's happening at the local level. Uh, the next point is that at the national level, in line with the Durban Program of Action, member states should adopt uh, action plans to combat racism and specifically Afrophobia. These plans should recognize historical and structural injustices faced by people of African descent and take concrete steps and propose concrete steps to address uh, 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 this. Uh, they also need to set out real and effective policies to address racist violence against people of African descent, but also tackle structural disadvantages experienced by people of African descent in all areas of public life. Next, migration policies need to be uh, changed to stop deportation of uh, black people back to uh, Libya. Uh, there must be respect for the principle of non um and that EU must guarantee safe corridors for migration to Europe. Uh, there's a uh, recommendation that we need robust, independent, effective investigatory bodies in which victims and the public have trust. Uh, police must be held to account uh, at an individual and a senior management level, and sanctions must be brought against those who abuse their powers. And we need oversight, uh, we need an oversight framework by which compliance with post-death uh, actions and recommendations to uh, learn from past errors are monitored, audited, and followed up. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, panel on uh, justice uh, ended with a call from uh, one of the, one of our brothers from Sweden uh, that something must be done. Now the other panel, the last panel was a panel on development, and you know I would just uh, suggest, Madam Chair, that the uh, comprehensive uh, nature of the um, report just given by my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Vereen Shepherd, on the question of uh, reparations uh, leads me to believe that I should not go further into this panel because it's very heavily on this question of reparations. But I would just uh, end this with the call that uh, Professor Shepard made herself, which is uh, a conclusion that the debt has not been paid and the account has not been settled on reparations. So thank you very much, Madam uh, Chair. I, I know I have done great injustice to all of the things that have been said here over the two days, but I think you all know it's up on YouTube, uh, and we will have a proper, uh, a comprehensive uh, report that will be circulated to you as soon as possible. Um, let me thank you, Ms. McDougall, for that um, summary, which was much more detailed than what I had expected as a summary. But let me console you with the fact that if you have given your statement, it's going to be reflected in the website of OSHR. So um, I would again encourage you 
to send your statements, the statements that you have made during this meeting. Um, now, before we close the meeting, I would call on a number of um, delegations who wanted to make a few comments before we end. I'll give the floor to Canada. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. On behalf of the Government of Canada, I want to once again thank uh, the High Commissioner and his office for hosting the regional meeting and to the members of the relevant UN mechanisms, states, and civil society for the enriching and thought-provoking discussions over the past two days. While there is much to celebrate in terms of the contributions and achievements of people of African descent, much remains to be done to overcome historic prejudices, prejudices and combat persistent marginalization and discrimination. In closing, I wish to reaffirm Canada's support for the objectives of the International Decade for People of African Descent. The provinces of Ontario and Nova Scotia have led the way domestically in recognizing the International Decade. Canadian civil society is also engaged. In December of this year, the National Black Canadians Summit will be held in Toronto in celebration of the international decade. And as a federal government, we are now considering how Canada might, we are considering how Canada might also officially recognize the decade. This regional meeting has provided helpful insight, insights and momentum that I will take back with me to Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, Canada. I see the European Union would like to have the floor, too. Thank you, Ambassador Stevens. Um, on, on behalf of the European Union, I would like to thank the, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for organizing and hosting the regional meeting for Europe, Central Asia, and North America on the International Decade for People of African Descent and to welcome the active participation of all stakeholders, especially from civil society. This meeting has provided an important forum for debate and discussion, as well as a forum to exchange experiences from different countries. Recognition, justice and development are the focus of our common work. We are acutely aware that our comprehensive legal framework, our efforts to fight all forms of discrimination, to criminalize hate speech and to work towards building inclusive societies are still not enough. Reality is telling us that. Efforts are being made, are being undertaken to reinforce our common action. So let me take this opportunity to give you some more concrete examples on recent developments. The European Commission has established a high-level group on combating racism, xenophobia, and other forms of intolerance to foster further change and dissemination of best practices between national authorities and concrete discussions on how to fill existing gaps and better prevent and combat hate crime and hate speech. This high-level group is also a platform for dedicated discussions on how to tackle specificities of particular forms of intolerance, also in light of the experience of civil society and communities. On the 5th of December, this high-level group on racism, xenophobia and other forms of intolerance will for the first time discuss racism against people of African descent. We are grateful to confirm the participation of representatives from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights who will present the outcomes of this regional meeting. Countries that have already adopted plans of action on the implementation of the decade, like the Netherlands and Germany, or who have included elements on their national plans of action to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance, like Sweden, will present their own plans. Civil society will also be present. The working group is considering to adopt an outcome document and, and we feel that this, this is an important step uh, in the framework of the implementation of the international decade. On the following day, and the colleague from Equinet has already referred to it, on the 6th of December, the Fundamental Rights Agency will publish the results of the second European Union Minorities and Discrimination Survey. This survey, for sure, will reflect data on discrimination, hate crimes against people of African descent, 
and surely would corroborate some of the comments heard during this meeting related to the underreporting of hate crimes, the increase of acts of racial discrimination in education, health, and by police forces. The Fundamental Rights Agency is also working on updating his handbook on ethnic profiling. Many of you have addressed in the past two days the situation of migrants in Libya. The European Union goal is and must continue to be the closure of detention camps in respect of, human, of its human rights obligations. We are working with the UNHCR and IOM to guarantee they can work in Libya. We are supporting their work to save lives and improve the living conditions of thousands of African children, women and men, inside Libya and along the migration routes. Also, it was announced yesterday that 50,000 opportunities for resettlement for those that are in need of international protection are being created. We believe that regular channels and the protection of those in need are the only possible alternative to irregular traffics. We have heard the message that has been passed on the urgency expressed by almost all of you who took the floor during the last two days. And we will take your clear messages to our political leaders. I thank you. Um, I thank you very much for that statement. Um, I have the front of me a draft, which is meant to be a declaration on present day slavery in Libya. Because the working group will be discussing this issue, I would like to give this draft to the working group and it will be considered when they discuss this issue. Is it over the weekend? Yes, over the weekend. They're having a special session to discuss um, in Libya. So I would give that um, statement to the chair of the working group. On that note, we are now reaching the end of our deliberations here, and I would just like to make a last few <laughs> closing remarks, which if you would allow me, I'll do from the podium. Mm. From the Distinguished delegates and participants at this second regional meeting of people of African descent. It has been a pleasure for me to chair this session. I want to start by looking at the Sustainable Development Agenda, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, which promises that no one should be left behind. On all accounts, we have seen from, the, from, the, from our work this week that people of African descent are indeed far behind. In order to ensure that they do not remain or get further behind, the program of activities of people of African descent offers us a way of hope to ensure this is the case. I would also like to note that both the program of activities for people of African descent and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda were approved by the United Nations General Assembly, which means that every state in the United Nations is committed to these um, um, two documents. I would particularly also want to mention the Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is peace, justice, and inclusive societies. It promises that in order to be able to meet all the Sustainable Development Goals, we need peace, we need, we need justice, and we need inclusiveness. And the question I'd like for us to take out today is, are we going to have that in inclusiveness before we come to the end of the um, 2030 sustainable development in 2030. I would like to appeal to all to think about this and to see how best we move towards the achievement of this goal, which we are all optimistic about. We, we all pledged that every effort would be made to reach the whole, um, the goals, the all 17 goals of the sustainable development agendas. 
In this meeting, we have had statements by member states and by civil society. We have been able to see the, 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 the um, importance given by civil society in particular for obvious reasons. But one thing that both groups have agreed upon are that a lot more needs to be done. And I think this was reiterated also by the speaker from Canada and the European Union in the last remarks they made. So we all agree that a lot needs to be done. And we have to work towards that. One thing is clear, that the decade and the program of action for people of African descent have had some impact, however small. It has served to draw attention to the plight of people of African descent. For many countries, at last, data that have never been in, in, collected are being collected. Is this enough? No. We need to work much more and to make every dream of people of African de um, descent, every claim, a reality. For the civil society, I always refer to civil society as the public conscience. We have had very powerful statements. We do understand your frustrations and realize the need to expedite actions. Let your cries be a stimulus for this action that is so desperately required. We have heard also that, um, um, and I think this has been said also, that civil society, you have a very important role, maybe much more than you appreciate, because we do believe that through your advocacy, through your work at the country level, a lot can be achieved. Because sometimes there's the false expectation that the United Nations can put pressure on states to implement what the, um, some of these um, 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 agreements. But what has worked, not only in the, in the context of people of African descent, but in many other fora, is that civil society d do make a difference. And I would, I would urge you not to be, not to be tired to make sure that you go on and make sure that the action is taken at your country level. I'd like to applaud the countries of, this, of these regions covered by this meeting who have actually moved one step further to actually launch the program of activities for the decade. Um, they should be a shining example. I would also like to take this opportunity to say that Launching the activities is one thing, but the resources are required to make, bring them into action. And I would call on all states to, uh, to, be, to empower civil society, to assist and finance the work of civil society in their movements towards um, the, the implementation of the activities of the decade. Now, as chair of the Intergovernmental Working Group, on the effective follow-up of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, let me assure you that I would do my utmost. I would call on all those states that um, have not yet done so to work more effectively in terms of reaching the, the goals which we all aspire to. I would like to say that those states that have not been present at this conference would need to be encouraged to show much more interest in the work of the, that we are doing here today. And we do hope that the absence here does not mean a lack of commitment to meet the, um, the objectives of the, the decade of people of African descent. As chair of the Intergovernmental Working Group, I should also say that I'm very much concerned with the recent events in Libya and would also do everything in my power to make sure that the organs that deal with this would give it the attention that it deserves. Now, we have come to the end of this, our deliberations here today. We have had the summary of the side events. We have had a brief summary of, the, um, of our deliberations here. We have also heard that there's 
is an outcome document being worked on by the member states and that we should be unfortunately could not reach a conclusion by the end of this meeting but we assure you that once the member states reach a conclusion this would be sent to everybody and would be posted on the website of website of OHCHR I would also before ending like to thank you very much for your participation in this meeting it means a lot the impact might not be immediately apparent, but let me assure you that we have moved one step further in terms of meeting the, the, the objectives of the decade of people of African descent in the Europe, Central Asia, and North America regions of the world. Let me start again by thanking you very much to also tell you that we have living testimony of our deliberations here because we do have everything documented on a YouTube, and I think you have the address, which we could leave to look at um, for as long as it takes, as a reminder to us as some of the commitments and some of the points we made at this meeting. I would also like to assure, because I got a question last, um, um, yesterday as to reporting on implementation of the activities of the decade of people of African descent. I'd like to assure you that the OHCHR reports annually to the General Assembly and collects uh, information for that report. So on that note, it, it remains for me to thank everybody, to thank OHCHR for organizing this meeting, for inviting us all to be here, to thank the moderators for the great work they have done you would, assure, you, would, you would agree with me that we have had excellent panelists in both all three panels that we have listened to. We have taken note of all the wisdom that they have given to us, and we would like to thank them most sincerely for coming here and agreeing to share their knowledge with us, and would assure them that they, what they have presented to us would enrich further action in this regard. We would like to also thank the interpreters. Again, there was a thank you that went to interpreters today. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to, for getting us to understand each other, which is extremely important, because if we did not understand each other, then we are not talking to each other. So thank you very much for facilitating that aspect of the work. Um, I had mentioned it before, but I think it's, it's appropriate to close by thanking OHCHR for all the support they have given to make this event possible. I'd like to thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to your continued engagement as we move towards the implementation of the decade of people of African descent. I thank you. close of the meeting. Yeah. I give the floor to the secretariat. In fact, we received some information from an NGO just to tell you that there is an event that is going to take place this evening in Geneva at the Maison Internationale des Associations and it's the, a representative of the Black Associations and UPAF from Switzerland, the pu Public Universities of Africa that is um, inviting you. And the address is Rue des Savoies 15. I don't know if the person who gave me this could explain rather better what the address is, where this is going to take place, because I imagine that our visitors here are not very familiar with Geneva. Distinguished participants, distinguished delegates, I would declare this meeting closed. Thank you.